Okay, uh, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm Richard Heeks. I direct the Centre for Development Informatics up at the University of Manchester. We like to think of ourselves as the largest academic centre worldwide working on ICTs and international development. We've got 10 staff, around 30 doctoral researchers and uh, over 100 postgrads. I've been working in the field for more than 30 years since trying to load leprosy patient records onto a Tandy PC in Nepal. And because I've been working in the field such a long time, um, I from time to time take a bit of a chronological perspective on what's going on. In particular, I quite like to try and get a feel for the future of the field. So mm, recently I've written on ICT for D2.0, which is looking specifically at the future of, uh, of this particular field. And I've also got a continuing interest in Development 2.0, which is trying to understand <coughs> what, is the, um, what, what are the ways in which ICTs are helping to transform development processes and structures. But today, I'm stepping back and I'm asking two more basic questions. First of all, how is the international development agenda changing? And secondly, what are the implications for development informatics research? So, uh, in terms of the content of what I'm going to be uh, presenting today, I'm going to talk a little bit, actually I'm going to get you to talk a little bit about uh, trends in development and trends in informatics. I'm going to talk about the post-2015 process and where we are in that process. I'm going to spend <coughs> quite a bit of time just stepping back and checking that this is the right thing to do if we want to understand future research priorities, and then I'm finally going to... Um, get to the meat of the presentation and talk about the, post, the content of the post-2015 agenda and also to talk about what the implications are for research priorities in development informatics. Uh, a small terminological point, you will have heard me use this term development informatics. I try to argue, largely unsuccessfully, um, that development informatics is the term that we could use for the research field and ICT for D is the term that we could use for policy and practice. A small victory uh, in this is that the UK Research Councils now list development informatics as a sub-area of research under development studies. But more generally, of course, we know that development informatics and ICT for D and ICTD uh, are very unhelpfully all used as synonyms and unfortunately they serve to give a sense to the outside world of a, of a fragmented field, something that we unfortunately have to live with. Okay, but if we go with the label of development informatics, why should we be interested in looking at international development in order to understand development informatics? Well, fairly obviously from uh, the name itself and from the little diagram that's shown there, development informatics is the intersection of in disciplinary terms, development studies on the one hand and informatics on the other hand, which we can see as a continuum running from computer science at the harder end through human-computer interaction to uh, information systems. So future trends, future priorities in development informatics are going to be guided by, determined by uh, significantly trends in development and also trends in informatics. I'm not going to say very much at all about trends in informatics. As I said, my focus is going to be on trends within international development. There are various ways in which one could look for trends in international development, and it would be interesting to hear from you what might be some of the other approaches that we could use. And more generally, I should say that this is a, a research in, in progress, hopefully a couple of papers coming out of it, but <coughs> I'm very much in the moment of wanting to receive feedback about what I've done. As an overall, what I've done is I've looked at the Millennium Development Goals and I've looked at the post-2015 agenda and I've said, well, what's, what's different? You know, what, what are the trends that are, that are going on there? And so I'll be talking quite a lot about those two things, summarising them at times as the MDGs, something I'm sure you're all familiar with as an acronym, but also the PTDA the post-2015 development um, agenda. So, the Millennium Development Goals were set around the year 2000, actually they came out in, in 2001, 
But as I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are aware, they have a sell-by date of 2015. That was when we were supposed to have achieved the Millennium mm. Development Goals by. And therefore, if they end at 2015, there's got to be something that comes after them, and that is the post-2015 agenda. So we have kind of two marker posts, if you like. We have the year 2000, and we have the year 2015, and we can think about what are the trends and what are some of the uh, differences between those two things. So what I'd like to do, I'm breaking all the kind of norms of uh, an uh, academic seminar, is I'd like to get all of you to talk to each other at the beginning of, of this and to think about the year 2000 and the year 2015 and to think about what are some of the main differences between those two marker points, in particular to think about what are some of the trends that we can see by looking at those differences. Um, so what I'd like you to do is if you could just kind of pair yourselves up or form yourself into um, threes uh, as you're sitting naturally, could you make sure that you introduce yourself to the person or people that you're talking with and can you just um, try and think about, in particular in terms of development or in particular in, in terms of informatics, what are some of the key trends, the key differences between the year 2000 and the year 2015? So I'll give you about three or four minutes to talk about that and then we'll get you to say what you think has come out and then we'll see you. If you can just kind of keep it to, to just bumper stickers rather than uh, explanations, would anybody like to throw out a few key trends or one key <coughs> trend maybe uh, around development, around international development to start with? Anyone got any key trends around international development? Go ahead. From public sector to private sector. Okay, then. fine. Yep. Any others from development? Um, the move, uh, there's a shift from uh, big government funding towards private foundations. Okay. And also, so in the origins of the funding and also in the where the funding is going, a shift from uh, giving budget uh, support directly to governments to more grassroots. Okay, that's great. Long bump up. If but, uh, yes? <laughs> Any others for development? Okay, I think a focus from intermediaries shifting directly to the recipients, reaching out to the recipients directly. Okay. Any others from development people would like to pitch in? Okay, what about informatics, trends in informatics that people have seen? This is probably more the audience is key. Yes, yeah, go on. Uh, from computer to mobile. Okay, yep. And the sheer amount of people that are connected now. Okay, yep. Exponentially. The growth of networking, the growth of the, unders you know, the undersea cabling to Africa in particular. Yep, okay, connectivity as well. Yes? User generated data and information. Yep. Okay, fine. I'm sure you also came up with some others as well. You yeah. can kind of checklist them off if you like the ones on development. As I say, I'm not going to be talking particularly about informatics. I'm sure that, you know, there's many others we could think of uh, at a, a more specific level, things like cloud, 3D printing, mm -hmm. uh, sensors, and, uh, and so on. Before, though, I get into the details in, uh, of uh, the post-2015 agenda, why do this? Why look for trends and try to understand what their implications are for research agenda. Why don't we just pick a research topic that interests us or we think is important and go ahead with that? Well, I think three reasons. First of all, money. On the assumption that the post-2015 agenda is going to shape funder priorities, then if our research topic matches the post-2015 agenda, we're going to be more likely to get funding for that research. That's a question, by the way, that I'll, I'll check off a little bit later on. Secondly, in terms of, of outcome, the REF tells us that our research should be rigorous, original, and significant. Okay, so rigor, we can internally determine that by ourselves by how we design our research, but originality and significance are largely externally <coughs> determined perceptions. And what they guide us to, I think, is feeling into the river of our particular domain and trying to feel for the fast currents in our particular research topics. Because if we pick a research topic that is within a new and fast-growing trend, it's more likely to be perceived as original and as significant. It's more likely to be read by um, other researchers and, and, and by practitioners. I did a citation analysis of my own research a couple of years ago, which, uh, which uh, sh showed that that uh, was the case. And thirdly, and something that's climbing up the academic agenda within the, uh, within the UK, is impact. Assuming that the post-2015 agenda tells us about what matters in socioeconomic development, there could be no better guide to research prioritisation if we want our research to have a real-world impact and 
to make a difference. So there seems to be a value in using these kind of broader agendas to set our own research priorities. What is the agenda? Well, here's the bad news, which I'm sure you've all spotted. It's 2014. It's not 2016. So <coughs> we don't have a specific agenda as yet. What we have is a process. And one way to understand that <coughs> is via uh, this timeline here. So, hmm, interesting. It doesn't show up on the screen. Okay, I will use an old-fashioned pointing device. Um, we can start up here in September 2011 with the formation of the UN System Task Team, which is the, the, the core grouping that's working on the post-2015 agenda. During 2012 and 2013, there were a series of reports and there were a series of consultation <coughs> processes, um, and particularly a set of reports which have laid the foundation for the post-2015 agenda. During 2014, there's going to be more um, discussions and more reporting. In 2015, that's when the political negotiations really get underway, and January 2016 should be when the post-2015 agenda is in place. Being in the middle of the process, the question would be, well, what should we look at right now in order to understand what that agenda is? And here we run into a little bit of a snag. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the history of the Millennium Development Goals, but the Millennium Development Goals were actually formed on the basis of two separate processes. Um, the OECD was developing the International Development Goals and the United Nations was developing the Millennium Declaration. And those two together were put together in order to form the Millennium Development Goals. And somewhat bizarrely, exactly the same thing is happening all over again with the, um, with the post-2015 process, that we've got two separate but linked processes. So up at the top there, we've got the core post-2015 process. And then at the bottom, we've got a, an, another track, which is working from the Rio Plus 20 conference of 2012 to set up some sustainable development goals. And towards the end of 2014, those two together will be integrated and will form the post-2015 agenda. So that's the process. That's where we are at present. I'm going to now ask three stepping back questions before getting to the guts of what the post-2015 agenda is. First of all, uh, is it possible that there won't be a post-2015 agenda and a post-2015 framework? That seems highly unlikely. Uh, lots of processes and lots of structures are already in place. There's been a lot of political capital invested. There's a lot of momentum behind it. So there's going to be. We can, we can work on the assumption that there is going to be uh, a post-2015 framework. A second question we might ask is, how important is the post-2015 framework going to be to international development? Because if it's just going to be a sideshow or it's just a kind of report that sits on the shelf gathering dust, then we shouldn't be particularly interested in it in order to set our own research uh, agendas. We, of course, don't know at present what the answer to the question about how important post-2015 is going to be to international development. We're not going to know that until 2020. But we've got a couple of current guides that we could use. And the first of those is, is based there in terms of who's been involved and how many people have been involved in the consultations so far for post-2015. There have been more than 100 consultation activities worldwide. In each of those, on average, hundreds of development organisations, thousands of online contributions have taken place. So overall, tens of thousands of development organisations have already been engaged with the post-2015 agenda. So there's a lot of engagement, a lot of momentum in, in, in those terms, a lot of organisations already looking to engage with and understand the relationship of their development work with the post-2015 agenda. The other guide we've got at the moment is to ask historically how important were the MDGs to international development. Um, it, it's very easy to assume or just assert, oh well, you know, they're, they're very, very important. But over the past three or four years, there have been a number of rather more considered pieces of analysis which have teased out something I've summarised on the following qualitative graph. And what this suggests is the MDGs have had a very significant effect on the discourse and debate around international development. They have been key to supporting a significant increase in aid spending. 
they have influenced some policies. They've had a more limited impact on development outcomes and development practice, but they have had some impact. So it's a mixed picture overall with the MDGs, but it's not one that would suggest that we should ignore the post-2015 agenda. My third step back question is, how important is the post-2015 agenda going to be in shaping development research priorities and funding? And again, we can draw on a mix of current 2015 and historical MDG evidence to answer that question. First of all, we can look at how engaged are the leading development research institutes worldwide with post-2015. If we look at the states, the answer is not very. Uh, but that's historically true of the MDGs as well. US centers like Centre for uh, Global Development, the US, uh, sorry, UN, US based centers have not tended to really get engaged with, with UN development debates. It's the same with the MDGs, it seems to be the same post 2015. If we look outside the states, though, the top development research institutes, as ranked by the, uh, the think tank ranking, all of them have got a post 2015 program or a post 2015 initiative underway. So ODI and IDS here in the UK, uh, Canada's North South Institute, UNU wider in, uh, uh, in Finland, uh, German GDI, all of them have got uh, post-2015 initiatives. So again that suggests there that there is going to be a significant relationship between post-2015 and the development research agenda. And if we look historically at the MDGs we can also ask, or we can also analyse how important the MDGs have been to research agendas and to research funding uh, of those who fund development research. And that suggests that there's been something of a continuum from, on the one hand, Canada's IDRC, for whom the MDGs were relatively peripheral to their research strategy and their research funding, through Swedish CEDA, for whom the MDGs partly informed their research priorities, to DFID, uh, for whom the MDGs were and remain the core focus for research. So if we look at those two importance questions together, the importance to international development and the importance to development research priorities and funding, the evidence is somewhere on a continuum, but it seems reasonable to conclude that whatever its absolute strength and acknowledging that there'll be local variations, <coughs> the post-2015 <coughs> development agenda is going to be the single most important force shaping the future of development and shaping uh, the future of development research. It's certainly of sufficient importance for us to take very seriously in planning our future development informatics research priorities. We can say that if our development informatics research priorities are in sync with post-2015, at the very least we're <laughs> going to gain reputation and, and, and credibility and perceived relevance of, uh, of that research, and at the most we're going to gain greater amounts of funding, a wider audience, and more impact for that research. So we've checked then, to the extent possible, that it makes sense to use the post-2015 agenda to shape development informatics research priorities in the future. Um, I'm at about the halfway stage, so as I said, I'm going to just take a break there and ask if anybody's got some questions or some comments they'd like to make. Uh, at this stage about what's been covered so far. Yeah. Do you, do you see any link between the post-15 development agenda and the EU's Horizon 2020 uh, programme, which is billions of euros? Um, that's interesting. I don't know and I've, I've, I've not looked, unfortunately, is the, is the, is the answer to that, but that would be, that would be an interesting um, thing to look at. I mean, I've looked somewhat at the ICTs and certainly mm. there are some, some of the strands <coughs> that, I mean, if you know yeah. Horizon 2020, yeah have a look at what's coming up as well, because mm -hmm. you'll see that too, to some extent, you may see some, some links there. Ah, sorry, one thing I forgot to do was, um, I've, oh. because I know there's quite a lot of detail on some of the slides, <coughs> I've uh, made some, some, some of the slides. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, yeah? Just a quick question. The slide on the impact of the MDGs, uh, yes. graph, I was just wondering where the data was coming from. Um, uh, I, the, the paper will, will show where it's from, but it's basically yeah. from it's from four papers, and it is then my qualitative summary of what is said in those four papers. So there's no, that's why there's no, there's nothing on the x-axis essentially. So, okay. so it's, it's a qualitative summary of what those various sources have, uh, have said.
Okay, thanks for that. Any other questions or comments? Uh, there are, I'm sorry, there are only 20 copies of the, of the uh, handout, but of the slides, but I'm sure the slides will be available from OII. And, uh, uh, or if anybody wants to have copies, I'm very happy. You can just email me and uh, I'll send you a copy. Yeah, sure. Where's the largest resistance to the post 2015? Is there, resi That's is an there interesting resistance? Question. That's an interesting question. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't think. I don't think. I'd, I mean, you know, what would resistance be that we shouldn't have one? That we shouldn't have one at all. I think almost all the engagement at present and over the past two or three years has been about what's in the agenda mm. rather than whether or not we should have one. And there are some quite big questions about the whole shape of the agenda. Should it be something like the MDGs, relatively simple, but with all of the problems that come with simplicity, or should it have, um, should it have a kind of a greater complexity and and uh, in terms as well of should it be done at a global level, should it be done at a national level. So I think there's an awful lot of discussion about what exactly, the, the exact mechanism of, of the goals particularly that might come out of that agenda. One perhaps should differentiate, uh, as, as I do in the analysis I think, between the specificity of if there are some post-2015 goals versus the much broader agenda that they, that they then represent. But I'm... I've not seen anything that I would specifically call resistance to that agenda. It's all about the question of what direction does it go in. Okay, so how do we analyse the post-2015 agenda? Um, I've chosen to do a text analysis, and I've done that on what are currently the four main documents associated with the post-2015 process. Naturally, what one would need to do is, is to redo this exercise in two years' time or three years' time once we actually know what the agenda is. At the moment, we have some fairly strong signposts to that agenda, I would say, but what we, of course, don't have is the agenda itself. What are those signposts? Those signposts are these documents here. So we've got the UN realising the future we want for all. I'm afraid these kind of tend to use almost all the same words and then morph them into, into a you know, different order, so they get very confusing. But anyway, realising the future we want for all, and then it's update, a renewed global partnership for development. Both of those are documents produced by the core UN system task team. So we can see that those kind of represent the core of the post-2015 process. As part of that process, last year, a high-level panel was set up uh, led by David Cameron and, and the leaders of Indonesia and Liberia. That produced a report called A New Global Partnership, which was seen as significantly shaping the post-2015 agenda. It's slightly more difficult for the bottom half, the bottom track, the Rio Plus 20 track, but the, because that's actually a little bit behind the UN system task team work. But the best guide we have at the moment is the outcome of the Rio Plus 20 conference, which was a UN General Assembly resolution, which is called The Future We Want. So what one can do is one can crunch all of those into a single document and then analyse that and look at the text. When we do that, uh, here's a first example, which is the tag cloud for uh, the content. But you'll already see that there are two problems with uh, doing an analysis by this sort of just basic word count. The first is that we get a bunch of words which you know, <coughs> must and need and also, you know, words which, which aren't meaningful at, at all, they're just generic. And then unfortunately we also get a set of words which are related to international development but don't really give us a sense of what the actual issues are. The biggest one unfortunately being development and, and countries and, and, and developing. Yeah, fine. That doesn't really tell us what is changing or really give us an understanding of the true colour of the post-2015 agenda. So what one has to do is to strip out all of those just generic little words and also words that don't have a particular meaning and direction within development. When you do that, this is what you end up with, which is a list of the most frequently appearing meaningful terms in the post-2015 documentation. I'm not going to say a lot about that because I'm actually more interested, as I've said right from the start, in, in, in the notion of trends, but one can draw some basic conclusions from this. For example, uh, 
the sustainable development paradigm is very, very strong within the post-2015 documentation. There's a smaller role to play, if you look at inclusivity and inequality, for a paradigm of um, inclusive development. If we're looking at specific goals for development, then environment and poverty are the two most important focal issues. But the issues within the initial MDGs still remain strong. So health and education, poverty, uh, women's empowerment as well. All of those are still quite strongly represented. Technology, there's quite a strong recognition for technology within development. And there's also quite a strong recognition for what we might call the mechanisms and the practices of development, so in represented in words like uh, partnership and cooperation and uh, impact and implementation. So that gives us a little bit of a sense of the content of the post-2015 agenda. But as I said earlier, I see a real value in trying to prioritise around those fast-moving currents for funding, um, for citation and, and for impact reasons as well. So we need to understand what are the trends. What are the issues that are moving up the development agenda? What are the issues that are moving down the development agenda? So in order to do that, I compared the post-2015 documentation with the three core documents behind the Millennium Development Goals, which are the OECD Development Assistance Committee's uh, Shaping the 21st Century Report, which laid out the international development goals that morphed into the MDGs, the United Nations um, we the People's document, because that laid the basis for the Millennium Declaration and the MDGs. And then thirdly, the actual MDGs themselves, which are uh, Section 3 of a, a General Assembly report, roadmap towards the implementation of the United Nations Millennium Declaration. So we've got two hunks of, 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 of documents, and we can do uh, a fairly simple comparison of the two, which is shown here. The way I've calculated this is to average the absolute change in frequency of terms with the percentage change in the frequency of terms, and then I've normed them by, in order to make sure they can be combinable, by, by, um, using, uh, by dividing through uh, the standard deviation in order to give a sense of the average deviation from, from this being the zero line there being the MDG. So this represents how much things have changed in the post-2015 documentation as compared to the MDG. So for example, um, environment issues have risen the most. Um, terminology relating to MDG 8, which again, if you may know, MDG 8 was the kind of the bucket one at the end that a lot of stuff got chucked into, but some rather specific ideas uh, falls by about as much as, say, rights and justice rises. As you may spot from the terms at the bottom, these are portmanteau issues rather than individual terms. So each of these issues is made up of a number of, of, uh, of terms which are all on the spreadsheet somewhere and they'll all be in the, they'll all be in the, uh, uh, the paper that, uh, that, that comes out. You could choose different terms, you could make different issues um, out of that. Mm -hmm. there, there were some differences that one could make in calculations. But if you look at the kind of raw data, at the extent of the language that is actually changing from one set of documents to the others, I think it's fair to say that these are a, the, these, these are a reasonable representation of the changes in the two sets of documents. And in the paper I'm writing, I break them down into four kind of categories. So issues which are diminishing on the uh, development agenda, issues which are continuing at roughly the same level, issues which are expanding somewhat, and issues which are expanding significantly. And then to give a little bit of extra categorization, I, um, so those are the four categories down there, I divide them into development goals and development mechanisms, and I couldn't really think what complex adaptive systems was, so I call that development perspectives. Um, I, I'm not clearly going to have time, fortunately, <laughs> to go into each one of these in, uh, in detail. So I just wanted to give a bit of an overview of the trends that one sees here. First of all, what's diminishing in the development agenda? Some things that were hot topics at the time of the MDGs have fallen away somewhat. So debt, for example, and drugs as well. 
and the idea, which kind of already came up a little bit in the uh, in the discussion here, that aid and donors are the dominant mechanism for funding development. Reflecting sectoral changes, we see manufacturing falling off relative to uh, uh, to services, and reflecting the decline in war and, and conflict, insecurity falls down uh, slightly on the agenda. Another thing, uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember or were interested at the time, that was a really hot topic at the time of the MDGs, was ICTs. And, and to some extent there has been a fall, a fall away in, in that topic. But if we break up the issue of informatics into its constituent parts, we actually see a slightly more <coughs> mixed picture. Discussion of ICTs, discussion of all things digital, has fallen off to quite some degree. And that should be no surprise. The MDGs were written at about the peak of the dot-com bubble, at a peak of concern and interests around the digital divide, at the same time as the G8 was setting up the Digital Opportunity Task Force, the dot force. Uh, as you probably know, there's an ICT-specific target within the Millennium Development Goals. And that kind of peak of interest in ICT for Ds rolled on into the World Summit and the Information Society in Geneva in 2003, and the World Summit and the Information Society two years later, 2005, in Tunis. Now, Wussis in Tunis, nearly 20,000 people attended, and it looked like there was going to be a massive kind of chain reaction explosion about ICTs for, uh, for development coming out of Wussis. But I remember on the very last day talking to um, a, a DFID official who, um, in, an, in an echo of the end of Casablanca, given it was North Africa, said, um, Richard, you might think it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship between ICTs and development, uh, but you're wrong, it's the end. Uh, he <laughs> was nearly right, because uh, lots and lots of organisations saw WISIS as, as, as the opportunity, the 2005 one, to say, fine, we've ticked that box, mm -hmm. that's the end. And you saw this precipitous decline of ICTs from the centre of the development agenda from 2005. Um, some of us saw our careers following, uh, following the same track. Fortunately, uh, it pulled out of the nosedive around 2010, particularly for the reasons that are shown there and that are reflected in, in the, in the um, post-2015 agenda, which is, first of all, the great explosion in, in, in mobiles. We're going to be hitting one subscription per um, member of world population this year. Of course, that isn't the same as everybody having a mobile phone, but it's still nonetheless quite a significant figure. And we've seen this great explosion again, as was mentioned earlier, in data production, something I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on. So overall, putting all those things together, that, that mixed picture inside, informatics falls into my second category, May I ask a question about the previous slide? Sure, go to ahead. To what extent is this um, a shift in actual substance <coughs> and to what extent is it just semantics? <coughs> I and Mark were told by uh, IDRC that we have to uh, take away all the mentions of ICT in our proposal and replace them with internet mobile technologies and then they would accept the uh, proposal. <laughs> yeah, no, no, sure, absolutely. I mean, so, so we've got to, you know, we've got to, we've got to change Clearly, all we're talking about here at root in terms of the data is a change in is a change in language, and you know, is it only a language that's changing? Well, that's that's what the raw that's what the raw data that's what the raw data that's all the raw data is 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 showing us. But I mean, I think in terms of what I've just explained, it does mirror these broader trends, if you right. like, that that ICT for D sort of rose up, then fell down, and and has risen back up again, and that seems a reasonable explanation to link that to the WISIS process and, and the feelings of development organisations of that uh, what had happened after uh, after that that it was somewhat the end of a the, the end of a process and, and so on. So I think it does reflect real trends in in change. What particular funders want and what's seen as particular hot topics, yes that language was changed and in a way that fits with the overall thrust of what I'm trying to say, which is we've got a change in language but that also reflects a change in priorities, and our <laughs> research probably needs to think about the change in those priorities that that change in language 
uh, that that change in, in language represents. I mean, certainly in terms of the amount of funding for ICT for D research, you can again see something like that, mm. something like that, that curve. And we've also got slightly, of course, that problem of, of the constant striving for novelty that kind of, to some extent, development organisations feel, oh yeah, we did that ICT thing, didn't we? We did that kind of in the, in the beginning of the, two, of the 2000s. And so, in order for them to come back to it, they have to feel that, that there is something new, a new story to be told. And that new story may be reflected in things like mobile, may be reflected in things like the data agenda, or in, some of the, or in linking to some of the other aspects of change within the development agenda that, um, that I'll... That I'll so do we as a field need to come up with a new buzzword, new acronym to replace ICTD? Internet and mobile for development is a bit unwieldy. <laughs> Big data. <laughs> Big data. <laughs> 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 Big development. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, I'll, I'll kind of, there, there are some bits and pieces later on that, that may, f may reflect that. So let's, let's yeah, let me, let me come back to, to that. Just, can I just yeah, ask yeah. a question? Um, you were using the term development organisations. Yeah. Are you meaning funders or people? Who, I mean, or others? Because for me, there would be a difference between people who are actually developing projects and people who might be funding. So, them. so one of the one uh, absolutely no, no, you're absolutely right, and I'm, I'm largely talking about uh, organisations who are funding in the global north. I mean, certainly one of the bizarre things one saw with ICT for D is around the time of of, of the the MDGs, what essentially you had was organisations of the Global North trying to force ICTs on organisations of the Global South who thought, well, we're not ready for this and we don't really know what it is. And, and, and then you moved kind of five years later to a situation where funders in the Global North thought, ah, ICTs, I, I'm not really sure about that, I think we did that. And then organisations of the Global South were saying, hang on, now, you know, the technology's here, we want help to actually do useful stuff with this, will you give us some money? And the funders were kind of saying, oh, no, I think we kind of moved on a little bit to that. Hopefully, that, that, you know, that, those, are, those are sort of, those are stereotypes, of course, and, and those are the exaggerated stereotypes of the top and the bottom of the curve. Hopefully, we've reached a little bit more of a, a sensible medium now, in which case there is a little more balance between uh, between the, the, uh, those two types of, of um, development organisation. Okay, so informatics was part of my um, second category of, of things that uh, continue in the post-2015 agenda at roughly the same level of prevalence they, they had in the MDGs. That includes, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> MDGs 1 to 6, so we still see a continuation of interest in issues of poverty, education, health, women's empowerment. Um, a couple of them I was a little bit surprised to, to see, it may be a function of what's going on in Manchester at the moment, but urban development and institutional development, I had assumed, would be really kind of hot topics that would be right at the top of the agenda. The only explanation I can put for the fact that they show a continuity is maybe they were already recognised within, at the, at the end of the late 1990s, institutions were already recognised as important, the demographic tipping point. Uh, the move from uh, rural to uh, to urban poverty was already recognised and incorporated into the mm. into the MDGs. The third grouping is a set of issues that have expanded somewhat on the development agenda. Some of those reflect real world changes since 2000. The issue that was that was mentioned in in the discussions, which is that remittances and foreign investment and other forms of funding have now taken over as much more important than aid flows, at least in an overall sense. Uh, data and mobile, I already mentioned, those have, have uh, increased uh, significantly in reality, and that's why their discussion of them increases as well. Some of those issues, I can only say that they must be, I, I sort of interpret them as seeds that were planted in the 1990s, but have only come to fruition uh, much later on. I'm talking there about livelihoods, capabilities, rights, and uh, rights and justice, the roots of which all lie in, the, in work, in classic work by Sen and others in the 1980s and 1990s, but they don't really seem to have hit the, the MDGs, but have, but have come along a little more latterly. And technovation is, is uh, a bit of a similar, a similar issue. Technology and development's always been seen as quite a big issue, but somehow it disappeared from the development agenda in the 1980s and 1990s, and technology and innovation have only really reappeared onto the development agenda since the year 2000. And a couple of those items there, I think, represent even more recent changes. The interest in growth and jobs can probably be laid at, at the feet of the um, economic crisis in the West, where Western countries started really thinking, oh gosh, we, we need growth and we need jobs, and that sort of flowed over 
uh, into, the, into the development agenda, and complex adaptive systems, particularly the kind of core idea of resilience, which kind of seems to be everywhere these days, uh, that's something that's really only rocketed up the development agenda in the past three or four years. The interpretation I've heard for the growth of <coughs> growth and jobs in, in the development agenda is that it was really the Arab Spring revolutions that basically okay. rocked some uh, actors like the World Bank into action because they wanted to avoid further political upheaval and providing young men with jobs would be yeah. okay. one means of disarming them. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. That, that Yes, that, that, would, that would be logical as well as to explain why did it get onto the development agenda rather than just being an, an issue of the global north. And I think um, that also helps to explain some of the issues that have seen a significant expansion because one of the things we've seen during the 2000s is increasing evidence that we're getting growth overall within countries but growth with increasing inequality. So a number of people are left out and excluded from employment and, and from the jobs market. So that's why... Inclusive development is getting a much, um, a much bigger profile. We've seen much more the realities of, of climate change and those have pushed environment and sustainability to the top of the development agenda. We've seen during the 2000s a doubling in the rate of international migration, so migration has really been pushed up the agenda as well. And we've got this move from a standard model of development involving aid and donors working through governments and NGOs to a model of development that is much more about multi-stakeholder partnerships and communities and, and business. I think that, that last one is, is partly uh, a reality, but it's also partly a change in worldview about what matters in, in development. And we can also see that in the two final issues that have really risen significantly up the agenda. The first of those is open development, not in the sense that IDRC is, is, is trying to push, but much more specifically in terms of transparency and accountability. And the second one is this much greater interest in development practice and development projects. You've seen that, for example, in the, uh, Jim Kinder, the um, head of the World Bank's uh, focus on the science of, of, of delivery. And that's risen particularly, you might see, uh, compared to the interest in development strategy and, and development policy. As with all inductive work, it, it's, it's easier to see the trees than, than the wood. I, I, looking at what we've got here, you can say, OK, we've got a much richer, more multifaceted picture of development than we had with the NDGs. You can also say that the paradigms of sustainable development and inclusive development are perhaps challenging the neoliberal and the human development paradigms. That's about as far as I got. So if you can see some other kind of big picture stories to bring out of this data, then, then, um, then please, please do let me know. But finally, let me get to the punchline. Mm -hmm. What does all this mean for development mathematics uh, research? I could have um, used a static content analysis of the post-2015 agenda, the one I, I showed earlier with that table. I could have used the sweep of the dynamic trends in change from MDGs to the post-2015 agenda. And I do use those both partly in setting these priorities. Mm -hmm. But what I also did is another textual analysis. So just as I compared the post-2015 agenda to the MDGs, I've compared the content of development informatics research to the post-2015 agenda. And I got that content of development informatics research by looking at three key sources of development informatics research outputs during 2013. The first was all the papers published in the journal Information Technologies and International Development. The second was all the papers presented at the IFIP WG 9.4 Jamaica conference. For those who may not know, IFIP WG 9.4 is the longest standing academic grouping working on and producing conferences on ICTs and development being the business since the 1980s. And all the papers at the more recent arrival, which is uh, IC the ICTD series of conferences, all the papers at the ICTD 2013 conference in, uh, in Cape Town last month. 
again, I was looking for issues that were overall underrepresented within the development informatics research agenda compared to the post-2015 discourse, and that's what that slide there shows. But I've also supplemented that comparative analysis in various ways. <coughs> Firstly, by doing what you might call a manual analysis to look at all of the 116 papers <coughs> that were involved and actually look at what specifically mm -hmm. is the research topic that they're looking at. Then mm -hmm. I've used somewhat less these portmanteau issues and more the individual terms that make them up and also as well as looking at the individual terms, looking at their meaning within specific contexts within the papers. And I've also paid, or tried to pay more attention to the relative rather than the absolute positioning because the fact that pretty well everything is, is, is below average is, is somewhat of an artifact of the fact that the, the nature of language used in academic papers is different from the nature of language that's going to be used in, in UN reports. So, using that analysis of the static content of the post-2015 agenda, the dynamic trends, and particularly this relative over and underrepresentation of, of individual terms, I've produced the following list of research gap priorities in development informatics. So, 15 topics for a post-2015 <coughs> world, running from the highest at the top, that's the most, that's the topic which is most underrepresented at present within development informatics research, and just working my way downwards until I got to 15. So these are the gaps. That's not the same, therefore, as saying, well, what should be the totality of the post-2015 development informatics research agenda? And that is here. The, the difference is, so that's starting at the top with the most mm -hmm. underrepresented topics. I've tried to <coughs> categorize them according to the nature of the goals they particularly relate to, and also categorizing some as mechanisms. But the main difference is these issues at the bottom don't appear on the graph because mm they're important within development informatics research but they are already quite well represented in the current work that's being done so there's a lot of work going on on ICTs and health in developing countries on e-learning in developing countries a lot of work being done around ICTs and capabilities and a lot of work being done on mobile but that's the overall agenda you will again be pleased to hear I am not going to talk about every single um, item on that diagram. I'm just going to pull out five and say a little bit more about what actually might be the research agenda within those elements. Firstly, on the basis of this textual analysis, environment and sustainability is by far the biggest growth trend on the development agenda and by far the biggest gap to current development informatics research. None of those 116 papers addressed an environmental issue. So we've got a, a lot of research agenda that, that's, that's needed there. We've got a set of specific research topics, ICTs and energy supply in developing countries, ICTs and water supply in developing countries, e-waste and development. We've got one particular research topic that needs a lot more research, and that is IC sorry, research issue, I should say, it's broader than just the topic, which is ICTs and climate change. Particularly adaptation, but also mitigation and monitoring and, and strategies. And we've also got <coughs> one overarching research program that needs to expand, and that is the role of ICTs within a sustainable development paradigm. Secondly, Poverty has not expanded very much on the agenda, but it remains the dual core of the development agenda alongside environment. And there are development informatics papers, those I, I covered in the 116 and also beyond, that quite a number that talk about topics related to poverty, but there's very little development informatics research as yet that has been directly about poverty. And I think it's possible to argue that the limited ability of development informatics research to date to effectively engage with the issue of poverty, with the, with the discourse, with the theories of poverty, it's arguably one reason why ICT somewhat slipped off the agenda of development during the 2000s. And certainly ICTs may struggle to find their way back onto that agenda unless they're going to be able to link to issues at the heart of debates about poverty and debates about environment. 
development of informatics research has been quite good at talking about the mechanisms and the processes of ICT for D projects. So participative approaches to design, <coughs> challenges of implementation, means of evaluating impact. But what research needs to do is to break out of the ICT for D bubble and show how ICTs can relate to all of those processes in mainstream development projects. So working out how do digital technologies help to enable multi-stakeholder activity in ordinary development projects. Uh, helping understand how ICTs can enable transformative development management practices like Lean and, and, and Agile. Helping us understand how ICTs can support more effective leadership within development practice. <coughs> Fourth area, second to sustainable development, this, the new worldview reflected in the post-2015 agenda is inclusive development. And again, development informatics research needs to break out of the bubble of just researching the digital divide to engage with other fractions of the inclusive development debate. So researching the emerging subdomain of inclusive innovation is going to help us understand how new ICT-based goods and services can be developed by and or for those at the base of the pyramid. Um, researching inclusive business models like impact sourcing is going to help us understand how new ICT-based jobs and incomes can be created for those at the bottom of the curve. And lastly, uh, as I've already mentioned, the growing diffusion of ICTs has greatly increased the availability of data. And we now have a research agenda around the data revolution in international development. There's a number of ways to slice this, but three obvious trends are open data, big data, and real-time data. With open data, there's already quite a lot of activity and discussion and, and, and writing, led particularly by Tim Davis and, and ODDC. But I think it's fair to say there's a lot of writing, but there hasn't been a great deal of really high quality researchers yet on open data and development, um, the whole, whole variety of topics, uh, the political economy of open data and development, uh, work which really helps to understand the differential relation of open data to transparency as compared to accountability. If we look at big data, we've got the emergence of mobile phone records, we've got easier access to mass survey material. We're on the cusp of, a, of an explosion of, of big data availability <coughs> for, for development. There's a lot of generic issues which are location blind and cut across global north and global south around uh, how do we produce it, how do we capture it, how do we analyse it, how do we visualise it. But I think the development specific topic is going to be how do we get development value out of big data through its effective use in decisions and actions in development policy and, and development practice. And then we've got real-time data, a real rise in that as, as crowd sensing becomes a reality. And we've got the thing from um, humans reporting via their mobiles to field-based sensors. And again, we've got a generic agenda around the technical and the socio-technical all along the, the information chain. How do, we, how do we capture, how do we input, how do we process, how do we analyze, how do we present this, this real-time data. But again, the real interesting development informatics research agenda, I think, comes within the, within the social, which is how do we move from traditional development systems built around the notion of lagged data to new development systems that can adhere to the tenets of Agile methods. So that's just five I've picked out. Of course, there could be more uh, that one looked at. To <coughs> conclude, we can divide development informatics research into five waves. The first of those from the 1960s to the 1980s dealt particularly with technology transfer for modernization. The second from the mid 80s to the mid 90s was interested in information systems and context. The third of those from the mid 90s to the mid noughties focused on access and the potential of the technology. And we're now coming towards the end of the 
fourth wave from the mid-noughties to the, to the mid-tens, which has had a focus, I think, particularly on design and, and impact. The results I've outlined set the potential agenda for the fifth wave of mm -hmm. development informatics research from the mid-tens to the mid-twenties. I'd like to say that the narrative would be development 2.0, but I think that only appears in, in part. It, the best quick summary at present seems likely to be sustainability and inclusion, but if you can see a better terminology or a better narrative to summarise the post-2015 agenda and those post-2015 priorities that I've, that I've indicated, then please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Richard, for the wonderful, really um, expensive, and looking into the future is never very easy, so thank you for trying that. Uh, um, I guess you have a better view of the, of, of the room, and it seems very <coughs> capable of, uh, of chairing yourself. Let me know if you need any help, but otherwise I will leave it to you. I just, I just want to ask you a question, because uh, um, what I was struck by also is how certain things haven't changed, mm -hmm. and how how serious can be not considering uh, a big change that's been going on. Uh, I'm talking mostly about Africa. Mm -hmm. And it seems that development is still uh, a technical problem that needs a, a technical solution. And also in your last slide, the one before this one, uh, you show that politics uh, is not taken into account uh, very much, or just a certain kind of politics. Uh, the 2015 with uh, big players such as China and uh, Africa growing at 10%, some countries like Ethiopia or Ghana, is a different world where countries are flexing their muscles and are resisting this kind of agenda. And you get these kind of paradoxes like the development darling, like Ethiopia and Rwanda, the one that are receiving the largest amount of money, are the ones that are resisting the most this kind of agenda. They are saying, uh, we have a developmental state type of ideals. Uh, ICTs have to serve our own purpose to build a state and build a nation. Uh, and uh, we play with this agenda. So we do like, uh, you know, writing good proposal. We just uh, uh, move ICTs and include like information, data, and mobile in order to attract your money. But then we do whatever we want with that. Uh, so I can see this kind of paradox where we still think that we live in the world where the global north uh, can set the rule and the global sound will follow, and we miss that some big change is going on uh, and uh, we can get badly wrong. Yeah, I think that's part, I mean, I think some of that's partly reflected in, in the kind of, you know, the notion of multi stakeholder partnerships and the recognition that aid and donors are, are falling down the agenda and that development is becoming a a somewhat different, uh, somewhat different process. So I think I think that's that's recognised to to some extent. Which, when you say that you see states like like Rwanda and Ethiopia resisting, I mean, they're not resisting the whole development agenda no. by, at all, are they? So, what specific components do you see them as, as resisting? Well, for example, someone mentioned, and it's also there, the move from the public to the private. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, the idea of countries like, you know, you have Paul Kagame thinks of himself as an ideologue. Uh, Melissa and I, who died a couple of years ago, thought himself as an academic as well as a head of state. Uh, so their idea was very much of uh, resisting that process uh, and resisting the, the problem of rent seeking that this kind of state can have uh, and centralizing it in the hands of the state and the state being the prime mover mm -hmm. of development. Uh, so this is a big change. This is, you know, it's a big change as compared to the agenda in the, in the 2000, and it's even more um, right now when they have the, with a backer such as China, mm -hmm. they have the courage and the platform for saying things that it was not, were not very pal palatable but is in a few years ago. But is one implication of that that those states might almost start to stand outside the post-2015 uh, agenda completely kind of thing, and that it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't necessarily have an impact? Because this is one of the other questions as well, is sort of, you know, right. who's who's left to develop, for example, and who is this really going to touch? Because you know, while the MDGs touched a certain number of countries, we've seen poverty reducing quite significantly since then. And we've seen, I mean, the MDGs are not, are not all going to be achieved, but we've seen, or clearly we've seen with all of those growth rates, we've seen a set of developments. So I think one of the interesting questions is, who sees themselves as within the purview of this post-2015 agenda? And one of the struggles mm. is going to be the extent to which it can be an in, an, an inclusive and all-encompassing process versus is it just going to be left to a development agenda that addresses a few very poor, conflict-ridden, landlocked, uh, landlocked states? Uh, and we don't know that, of course. Right. 
I'm sure there are a lot of other questions I don't want to just turn into back and forth. on this. I'm wondering if you could just unpack a little more for us what you think about the move maybe from objects to data in ict for d from, you know, um, attempting to sort of infiltrate the culture of, of, of low and middle income countries with technological objects to uh, observing them, surveilling them, learning from them, evaluating. Yes, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I mean in general, I as a person with an information systems background, I'm very pleased about a move from objects to data because, of course, you know, we, we think that uh, the objects don't matter very much. It's it's what they actually, you know, what they actually contain contain that matters. Um, in terms of what that what that actually means, you can of course see, as you've been, as you as you've hinted, pluses and minuses in, in terms of of, uh, of the agenda. So we can see examples where you get a bottom up data trend and, and you get the voices, voices of the, of the poor, for want of a better, better term, listened to and really having an influence on development uh, projects. We're, we're um, in discussions with a, with a group in, in, in Bangladesh who have been trying out a real-time data approach to development projects where, where beneficiaries on the ground will report almost on a kind of day-to-day -day basis via mobiles what's going on and you can have a much more agile methodology and that in a sense is also driving a much more participative, beneficiary-oriented uh, approach to development. On the other hand, in a world in which we're leaving more and more uh, footprints in cyberspace, it will also enable greater mass surveillance. Of, and and we're, already, we're already seeing that with many, many governments who are now where once they were sort of trying to block the internet, now they're trying to welcome the internet in many ways because they realise that they can use it for surveillance of their, of their opponents. Ultimately, of course, it's going to be issues of politics and political economy which are going to determine which of those kinds of models uh, will dominate, but I think, but I think it's a really, really interesting time. Maybe everybody always says that in their own field, <laughs> but um, but but I do think it's a very interesting time just at the moment exactly. because the because there, there there are lots and lots of new models emerging. I mean, we haven't talked really at all about about very much about new ICT enabled business model, for example, the growth of digital enterprise uh, in developing countries as well. So there's an awful lot of new governance models, management models, business models that are all becoming possible um, and our first job is going to be to chart those models and to understand them and then of course is to work out what institutional political factors are going to determine which of those models dominate and which of those, domi uh, which of those models don't. Thank you. So the analysis assumes a little bit that um, development informatics should align itself with the uh, with, uh, agenda, and you gave a very good rationale why that is the case. Yes. Um, but if, you, if I can ask you to be so bold and say name a couple of things that you think this uh, development agenda is missing out on that actually development informatics could tackle that is not covered in the, in the, in the uh, post-2015 agenda, Although it is actually a relevant, a relevant field, um, th there's there's nothing in that. I don't have anything like that because if there was anything relevant, um, it's it's in there. I found a way to get it in there. <laughs> yeah. I I I mean I'm ask, I've asked myself as well a little bit. Um, am I, you know, to what extent am I going to try and follow this agenda? And and um, I think a lot. Is, is the answer. So I, I actually do see it as a, I mean the, the thing is of course it's a very very broad agenda. You've got 15 topics within the within the trends and you've got a number which are argued as as, uh, as, as being not things which are currently underrepresented. You've got an awful lot there. I don't know, is there something, you, know, you may be better judges than me, is there something missing missing from that agenda? Perhaps that's the weakness of this kind of analysis, there's actually so many things in there that everybody can find something of, uh, of, of relevance to their work. And I, I, I think the key thing is, is the extent to which, uh, to what extent might we use this to really change what we're going to do in, in development. For me, the answer is looking up towards the, the higher levels of, of, of that list and thinking about to what extent am I really engaging with those items which appear to be the most important or the m most growing 
elements of, of the development agenda. But I would also say as well, a little bit of caution, that, that it, it will make sense to come back to this. It, it, you know, this should be a continuous process that one's always doing. It just happens that we're in a particular moment in time where there's something big that we know is coming onto the agenda and it makes it relatively easy for us to do this analysis. Certainly I'd want to come back to this in two or three years' time and ask, you know, is, is, is this right? Environment and sustainability, for example, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's much, much bigger than, than anything else. But partly that's because of the Rio Plus 20 um, component within post-2015. But Realpolitik will swing in in 2014 and 2015. It'll be interesting to see what actually uh, emerges on the true post-2015 agenda. That was, that was actually one of the reasons why I was asking the, questions, the, the question. You, you mentioned that there was no paper at all in the papers you analyzed that, that looked at environment. Did I, did I catch There's that nothing right? directly in those 116 So, you know, you would have to wonder why is that? Does development informatics just not lend itself to, to, to these kinds of applications? You mentioned a couple of exam examples where you would think it you know, could lend itself to at least certain, certain technologies. Um, it's, it's striking to see that, right? www.nict.org n i c c d .org, is the results of our IDRC funded project on ICTs and climate change, which has got lots of case studies and lots of research agenda, a research agenda paper and lots of background papers and, and, and so on. And I thought when we started that project in 2010, these would be kind of a real foundation of, of, a, of a massive growth in, in work on ICTs climate change and development, ICT's environment and development, but it, it, it hasn't been, and it is very odd. Partly, perhaps, it reflects <coughs> what's happening in Western society, that we've got a, quite a troubled relationship with environment and, and, and climate change. You know, we seem to have moved to this very odd stage where people absolutely, in uh, some sense, accept that climate change is, is, is real and it's behind the floods and the changes in, in weather. And yet somehow it's, it's sort of fallen down the agenda mm. because of the economic crisis. So, the, uh, so uh, rather long-winded answer. But I think one answer may be because climate change and environment issues within Western society have somewhat fallen down the agenda in, in, in recent years. So we may have this sort of odd disjuncture at the moment. It remains to be seen, assuming Western economies get themselves back on track. Um, economically, whether environment and sustainability <coughs> will rise up the agendas of Western governments as well. But that could be an artifact. Whereas, for, uh, uh, um, for example, one of my researches is right now uh, working in, in a couple of urban communities in, in, in Costa Rica, and for them, they're on the front line of climate change. They really understand. Communities in developing countries absolutely understand that climate change is really important and a big issue for them. So we've got this odd disjuncture, I think, at the moment. And my assumption is maybe it will it'll come back up the agenda. I mean, it has to. It has to. Climate change is a reality, and adaptation particularly. Mitigation less so for developing countries, obviously, but adaptation, ICT's adaptation development, they're critical, critical issues. There's a question. Look, there's just, sorry. And I'm speaking as sort of, you know, someone who knows little about development and even less about informatics, but it's a great place to be um, here. But, but when you're talking about the lack of environmental applications of in informatics, and then you're saying that actually it is of importance to other countries where it's probably a more pressing issue, I mean, I suppose for me the question is you're talking in a paradigm which is looking at the almost the funders' interest in information, yes. not informatics, sorry, right word, um, because it might be better one way. And, um, but presumably there are models which are being developed elsewhere, and so where the direction of informatics is led from may be shifting, and I don't know to what extent you're engaged from your piece of research you did with IDLC or elsewhere, perhaps with work that's happening elsewhere in the world, um, in the South, for instance. Yeah, I, I mean, those, those three sources I, I, I looked yeah. at, clearly those three sources, 116 papers, that's, that's not bad, that's a pretty good spread, okay. but it's from only three sources, and therefore clearly my reflection of development informatics that I've given here reflects those sources, those sources I've used. I think, to be fair, all three of those sources are relatively good at drawing in material from the global south as much okay. from, the, from the global north. It could be it could be what you said, but with a slightly different spin on it, which it could be that 
there is quite a bit more work going on within the more technical end of, uh, of informatics. Mm -hmm. But I think the work that's going on there is very much led, it is very much mitigation led. I'm going off into a little bit of depth here because, because on, on, on climate change. One of, the problems, one of the problems we've really found was mitigation is the, is the key issue in the agenda of the global north. And it's also what ICT companies love. Because you can develop lots of new kit around mitigation. Green this, green that, smart this, smart that. Adaptation is much more problematic. It's much less of an issue for the governments of the global north who still tend to dominate the agenda. Um, and it's much more difficult to think of a new piece of kit that you can use for helping adaptation. Actually, helping climate change adaptation is much more about using applications we already have, but using them in better and, and, and different ways. So I think that's part of the problem as well, that there's a technical agenda that is quite active in this area, but it's been quite mitigation dominated, whereas the issue for developing countries and communities is adaptation, but there isn't very much sexy to say about adaptation technically, technically wise, so there isn't a lot of investment from ICT companies, and it, it, it's more difficult to get a handle on what exactly the research agenda and the development of new applications agenda is around, around adaptation. I have to say we in Manchester have stepped back from the notion of adaptation, and the way we're now going into it is via resilience, trying to understand, because that works much better as a concept that runs beyond climate change, because resilience is something that communities and countries need in order to cope not just with climate change shocks, but with other disasters and with social shocks and um, with economic shocks, shocks and so on. So that's actually the route that we're trying to go in at the moment, but we're right in the middle of that process, and I don't know, again, what we're going to uh, come out at the end. I'm a, an absolute firm believer that resilience is a key word for understanding the 21st century. One of the things I didn't really say was another one of the changes I, one might potentially argue that's going on here is that whether in, when, whereas in the year 2000s there was a sense of development always meaning moving forwards. I get a sense now that development means moving forwards but it also means not slipping backwards. Mm. There's a, there are there's some real concerns mm. that, that, that countries might start to go backwards. Gains mm. that have been made might be lost because we've got climate change coming and wiping things out. We've got, uh, the, the, you, know, if we, are we, you know, is this the only economic shock that we're going to have in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. If you believe the, the notions of complex adaptive systems, the more connected we become, the more shocks are going to spread through the system. So it's likely that the 21st century is going to be a century of increasing numbers of shocks and crises, mm -hmm. in which case we may start to move backwards, which is why resilience comes onto the agenda, because resilience is the way of saying, okay, it's not just about thinking about moving forwards, it's about kind of backstopping to make sure that we don't move backwards. So that's the way that we've moved into, um, move, kind of, that's the way we're moving forward in, in, in conceptual terms on, on, uh, on this agenda. I have a bit of a broader question, rather than MDG. But um, I, I followed ICT for the bit on, on the sidelines. I always get this idea, and also from the top, that uh, we often use informatics as an end for development. Uh, because, you know, we, as we said, we have to reinvent our own terms for ICTs uh, to make it sound relevant again. And we, you know, technology develops quite quickly for us as an advanced information society. So to what extent are we actually taking into account what our reflection or our, our own technology does in those countries? Are we not just confusing development projects or measuring the outputs of development projects? And are we, are we not sort of, are we taking into account the impact these technologies actually have ethically? Like legally, we can't even follow the technolo technologies in the Western world. So if we implement, keep implementing whatever new development we have here, over there, do we, is, is there anyone taking into account what's happening there? I think can, can I just add one piece? piggyback on, on this question, because you, you wrote, I said, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, is an amazing piece about technological failure. It was a bomb in the ICT for development world where everybody was talking about success, uh, and, but it was also bringing a lot of fresh air, because you had the courage more than anybody else to say, guys, you know, there are these kind of implications. A lot of things are failing because we don't take things into account. And now you seem a bit more upbeat. It seems much more optimistic about what's going to happen. Shouldn't we bring back that kind of concerns and uh, and uh, I I personally feel the need of it, uh, but 
you yeah. haven't been there for a while. So. I, I, I was I was scarred when I got invited in um, I can't remember yeah, yeah. two thousand and eight <laughs> or so to the World Bank to their to their ICTD annual gathering and, and when You're I was the Taylor guy. I'm the Taylor <laughs> guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, you know, it's absolutely. Uh, that's <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Um, and 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 actually, I mean, this is getting becoming quite personal. I, 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 also, <laughs> I also decided when I turned 40 that I couldn't spend a lifetime being against things and talking about negative things. And I was going to try and look for, for what was more positive within, within the research field. And I was going to try and look for models and ideas like resilience that I could actually feel, feel positive about. So part of that reflects my, my personal epiphany and, uh, and, uh, and psychology, I would say. And, 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 and also, to be fair, I did, I did blog last year about the fact that we, we don't talk enough about the, the dark side of ICT right. to, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for development. So um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still hanging on in there a little bit with, uh, with, uh, with reality checks. Coming back to your point, which, which things is, is very interesting, and I, and I think it's part of what's actually quite good and maybe reflecting what the, really said about, about the changes. I think we were very, very um, technocentric, maybe not in this period here. I mean, I'm summarizing desperately the, the very, very complex pictures. Maybe here, which was when information systems people particularly got involved in the, in the field and started talking about context. But that got kind of washed away when we had this, I should have done the waves in different sizes. This was a huge one, you know, when the internet came and, and, and the world sunk and, uh, and, and so on. People were very technocentric there. But I think actually there's been quite a good move beyond the technocentricity in a way it's the, the point about you know we're moving from objects to 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 data and so there is a bit less of this emphasis on readiness and access and infrastructure and mm, just focusing on well how many telecenters have we got working and and particularly the second bit of that there about impact there's a lot more thinking IDRC has been um, one of the one of the leaders in, in pushing this forward a lot more thinking about okay the kits in there so what what actually what are the impacts that it's having and looking at various ways of connecting the development ideas a particular strength around linking to um, to capabilities Dorothea Klein's work which I guess I should name check since she's coming up later in the uh, uh, in the series looking at capabilities but various other 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 work looking at linking to the livelihoods framework and so on so I think. Uh, I think in some sections we have we have moved beyond that technocentricity. That's not always true. One of the amusing things about going to an ICTD conference is it deliberately tries to mix in technical people, socio-technical people, and social social people. And and of course, it's always kind of amusing when social and social and technical people yeah. get together in the in the same room and uh, I each other up suspiciously. Mike Best wrote an absolutely brilliant summary of what social people think of think of technical people from the uh, the ICTD 2009 conference, which is, of course, that social people look at techies and kind of think, you know, when are you going to grow up and find out about the real world that's, uh, that's out there? And, and, and techies look at social people and say, when are you actually going to do anything concrete and, and deliver something real? So uh, that's, all, you know, that's always interesting mm -hmm. to see. So I think that technocentricity will always be with us. Uh, that's undoubtedly true. But I think as a field overall, Development and informatics has been relatively good at, at moving beyond that. And one of the good things, coming back to, to my earlier answer, that I that I like about the data revolution is, I can say that data is is an artifact as well. But it but it but it's kind of you know it's pushing us a little further down down the down the road. And so long as we don't get hooked up too much with the technical and the socio-technical agenda with big data and open data and real-time data, of thinking oh it's all about how do we analyze and how do we present. So long as we keep focused on the development agenda of these things, of how they're changing development processes, how they're changing development structures for both good and ill, and how they're enabling new models, and what will determine which of those new models succeed and fail. I think, I think you know, that, that, that's, all, that's all to the good. I guess the wine is ready. Yes, and, uh, is. So I, want, I don't want to prevent you from the wine, which is, no, is a priority. No, it's not on the agenda, but I'm sure it's on someone's agenda. So I just uh, wanted to thank you, Richard. I couldn't imagine a better way to kick off uh, our, our seminar series. Uh, and just before, mm. before clapping, and uh, uh, an important remark, because next week we will have a, an amazing talk, but it's going to be on a different day. So it's going to be on Monday at 4.30, because there is another big event on Tuesday. 
And uh, the event on Monday is uh, crowdsourcing development and emergency. So it's very cool, uh, um, cool topic. Uh, Gregory Hashmolov is coming from the LSE. I heard him speaking. It's great. If you can't make it, we have it online. So I shouldn't tell you. And on Tuesday, there is another. Is there a Victor Meyer Schoenberg's yeah. inaugural lecture? Right. That's why we're on Monday. And the examinations can but, sign uh, up if anybody's yeah. contested from the internet government. Thank you very much again for being with us. Thank you very much.